Hey there! It's me Eden. If you are new to the channel then please subscribe to my channel and visit my Patreon page for early access, link in the comment, thanks! The afternoon seemed to fly by and it was a little after four when the doorbell rang. Carol was closest to the door and went to answer it. I heard her say, Hi Brad. Merry Christmas. Come in. I stood up as Brad entered. He looked around the room nervously and said, Merry Christmas. I went over to him and took his hand to lead him further into the room. I'd like to introduce my friend Brad, Bradley Franklin Reese. Brad, this is my father, and this is my Aunt Jessica. You already know my mom and Carol. Extending his hand to each he said, How do you do, sir? How do you do, ma'am? It's a pleasure to meet Crystal's family. Even though he smiled during the introduction, Dad had a very strange look on his face and I could only guess at what he was thinking. Mom said, Take your coat off and have a seat, Brad. Thank you, Mrs. Ramsey. I helped Brad to shrug out of his coat and I carried it to the closet by the front door and hung it up before returning to sit next to Brad. He said, You folks really go all out for Christmas. I feel like I stepped into Santa's workshop. The costumes are great. Everyone laughed and Dad said, It looks like we all had the same idea. I didn't know that anyone else would be dressed up when I rented this costume. Mrs. Ramsey is the coordinator behind the costumes for the ladies. Do you attend Crystal's High School, Brad? Yes, sir. I'm a senior. I've been accepted at Penn State for the fall semester. Good school. Good football program, I understand. Yes, sir. It's my dad's alma mater and I visited there several times. I'm going on a football scholarship. What's your position on the team? Quarterback, sir. I've been the starter here for the past two years. Very good. And what do you plan to study at Penn State? Administration of Justice. Kind of a pre-law curriculum. Excellent. I said, that's enough, Daddy. Stop giving Brad the third degree. Dad looked at me with that strange look again before saying, I'm sorry. I didn't mean it like that. I'm only interested in who my little girl's friends are. It's all right, sir. I didn't mind. It's only natural for you to be concerned. Mom, in an apparent effort to change the conversation, said, Brad, would you like something to eat? We have a lot of turkey and other leftovers, plus several deserts. Crystal, take Brad into the kitchen and prepare something for him. Without waiting for Brad to respond, I stood up and held out my hand. He stood up and took my hand in his enormous one and docilely followed me to the kitchen. Once in the kitchen, he said in a low voice, I'm not really hungry. I just wanted to be alone with you. Of course. That's why mom suggested it. But you have to have something so it doesn't look suspicious to daddy. Do you like turkey? He nodded as he sat down at the table. Mayo, lettuce, tomato, salt and pepper? He nodded again so I went to work. I put on an apron before getting the meat and other things from the refrigerator. We still had some turkey sliced so I didn't have to get the full platter out. I got out a couple of slices of white bread, toasted them lightly, and then coated them with a thin layer of mayonnaise. I stacked the turkey thickly since most guys prefer it like that, put on a couple of slices of tomato, and a piece of lettuce. I added a little salt and pepper and covered the sandwich with another slice of toast before carrying it to the table and setting it in front of him. I started to ask him what he wanted to drink but before I could get it out, he took my arm, pulled me onto his lap and kissed me. 
I struggled for a second, then realized the futility, so I gave in and let him kiss me. I relaxed in his arms as his tongue explored every millimeter of my mouth, then went back to the beginning and started over again. When I felt that the kiss had lasted long enough, I started wiggling until Brad pulled back. Brad, behave yourself. My parents are in the next room. Okay. I'm sorry. It's just that you look so domestic in that apron. I giggled. And that excited you enough to want to kiss me? I don't need excuses to want to kiss you, but the way that you look, with your Santa's helper costume and the apron, well, you're just so cute that I couldn't help myself. Okay, now let me up before Daddy comes in. Do you want milk, soda, or juice? Milk, please. Brad let me get off his lap and I retrieved the milk carton from the refrigerator, stopping to get a large glass from the cupboard as I passed it. I placed the glass next to his plate and poured the milk into the glass. Brad snaked his arm around my waist as I worked. When I was done, I set the carton down and then extricated myself from Brad's grasp. I giggled and said, Bradley, eat your sandwich. Yes, ma'am. While Brad munched on his sandwich, I got out the pumpkin pie and cut two pieces off. I placed them on dishes, added forks, and carried them to the table. This time I didn't give Brad a chance to grab me. I placed one dish by his place and then quickly moved around the table to sit down in a chair across from him to eat the tiny piece that I had cut for myself. As we ate, Brad told me about his Christmas dinner. He had left his parents, grandparents, and a small horde of aunts, uncles, and cousins to come to my house after they had had their meal and visited for a while. He said that he had to be home by six o'clock for the goodbyes. As we finished eating, he said, I wanted to come over today to give you the Christmas present that I got for you. Oh, Brad. You didn't have to get me anything. I wanted to. It's in the pocket of my coat. Would you get it so that you can open it in here without everyone else seeing? Okay. I'll be right back. I left the kitchen and hurried upstairs first to retrieve the gift that I had wrapped for Brad. Then I came back down and retrieved the small, very nicely wrapped present from Brad's coat pocket. I shook the package gently next to my ear as I walked towards the kitchen door. I could hear something rattling so it wasn't a scarf or a pair of socks. Brad said, here, sit next to me, as he pulled a chair out for me and waited until I sat down. I sat down next to him and handed him my gift. He got a very surprised look on his face. Just a small gift that I picked up for you, I said. Open it. He slowly ripped the wrapping off of the small jewelry box and snapped it open. Wow, great! An ID bracelet. Thanks, Crystal. He looked at it closely. But it doesn't have my name on it. I wasn't sure if you would wear it or not. A lot of boys don't like jewelry on their hands and wrists. If you think that you'd wear it, I'll have it engraved, or else I could get you something else. No. This is great, especially since it comes from you. I'll leave it with you to get it engraved. Would you like Brad, Bradley, or something else? Brad is fine. Now open your gift. I began to remove the wrapping paper, trying not to rip it. When I had one end open, I could slide out the box inside. I recognized the box as coming from Romanoff's, one of the finest jewelry shops at the mall. I contained myself until I opened it. Inside was a beautiful 14K gold, heart-shaped pendant with nine stones. It was attached to an 18-inch gold chain. The stones must be diamonds because I knew that this jeweler didn't offer cubic zirconium stones. 
I uttered breathlessly, Oh, Brad, it's beautiful. But it's too much, too expensive. You have to return it. Just get me something simple. I thought that you might say that, but I can't return it. I had it engraved already. I looked at him for a second, then turned the pendant over and read the tiny writing of the inscription, to my crystal, the most wonderful girl in the world, love Brad. I got a little choked up from the sentiment. I managed to mumble, thank you, Brad. It's beautiful. Romanoff said that they wouldn't be able to fit it all on, so I took it around to all of the jewelers until I found one that thought he could do it. The one that you found did an excellent job. The script is very clear. Here, put it on me. Brad removed the pendant and chain from the box. He stood up and moved behind me to put the chain around my neck while I lifted my hair out of the way to make it easier. I sensed him fumbling with the closure for several seconds. His hands were so large that he was having trouble with the tiny clasp but he finally managed to get it closed. When he let go of the chain, I arranged the pendant so that it was centered above my bosom. Brad suddenly bent over me and started kissing my neck and the side of my face. Then he moved around and kissed me on the mouth. I decided that I owed him something for the wonderful present so I let him invade my mouth again with his tongue. While we were kissing, he put his left arm under my legs and lifted me up. Then he sat down with me on his lap. I had put my arms around his neck for support as he did this, so I still had my arms around his neck when we were settled. Daddy chose this minute to come into the kitchen. Excuse me, I didn't realize that you would be getting intimate out here, I heard him say. Brad quickly pulled away and started to stand up with me still on his lap. I would have fallen to the floor if I hadn't had my arms wrapped tightly around Brad's neck. Brad said, Excuse me, sir. I was just thanking Crystal for the Christmas present that she gave me. And I was thanking Brad for his Christmas present. Look, Daddy, isn't it beautiful? Yes, lovely, Dad said in a stern, fatherly sort of way. Brad stammered, well I have to be going. I promised my family that I would be home in time to see the relatives off. It's been very nice meeting you, sir. Merry Christmas. Brad and I left Daddy in the kitchen. Brad went into the living room to say, Goodbye to the rest of the family as I retrieved his coat from the closet. After he had put his coat on he gave me one more quick kiss before leaving. As I was saying good night to Brad, Dad was explaining what he had interrupted in the kitchen. He was speaking in a very low, but highly animated manner when I walked into the living room. Mom said, Crystal, your father is very concerned about you kissing Brad in the kitchen. Why? It was just a kiss. Daddy has seen me kiss on stage in front of hundreds of people and I've kissed, passionately, dozens of times on television in front of a nationwide audience. That was acting, Dad said, this is different. Oh, Daddy, kissing is kissing. Dad gave me an exasperated look and said to Mom, you explain it to her. How can I? I don't understand what the problem is. Your teenage daughter was kissing a boy in the kitchen. That's not a tragedy. This is 1999, not 1899. But she's not a teenage girl. She's only pretending to be a teenage girl. All the more reason. What could be more natural than for a girl to kiss a boy after receiving a nice gift? Crystal, were you excited by your kiss? I looked at mom. She knew that my medication kept me from getting excited. No, not in the slightest. I was thanking Brad for a wonderful and very expensive gift. Look at this pendant and chain, mom. Isn't it beautiful? Oh, my, yes. 
It is beautiful. Look, Bill. Look at the wonderful gift that your daughter just received. How else is a young girl expected to show appreciation for a beautiful and very expensive gift? Dad threw his hands up. I give up. I seem to be the only one upset by Crystal kissing a boy in the kitchen. I'm going to get the piece of pie that I went in there for. As Dad went back to the kitchen, Carol, Aunt Jess, and Mom crowded around me to look at the pendant. Carol said, Oh wow, cries. It's fantastic. Are those fake diamonds, do you think? The jewelry box was from Romanoff's. They don't sell any fake stones. Romanoff's? They only sell quality items. But it's always possible that only the box was from Romanoff's. Look at it. You don't find something like this at Walmart. Aunt Jessica said, Is that engraving I feel on the back? Yes, Brad had it engraved. Mom said, Let me see, honey. She read the engraved sentiment out loud. Carol said, Sounds like Brad is really getting serious. Congratulations, sis. Hush, Carol, Mom said in a low voice, don't let your father hear you. Let's just forget this for now. Raising her voice to a normal tone, she said, I want to take some pictures of our costumes. Crystal, go fix your face. I went upstairs to repair the damage to my makeup. When I came back down, everyone else was getting ready. Dad had the pillow back in and was putting on the beard. Mom, Carol, and Aunt Jess had all touched up their faces. Mom had set her camera up on a tripod and now posed us around the couch with the Christmas tree in the background. She stretched out a long cable release and joined us for some of the pictures. With the group shots done, Mom posed Carol and me on Dad's knee for several shots. In one shot, posed for the comedic value, Carol pulled down Dad's beard while I put on a shocked expression. Mom moved Aunt Jess, Dad, Carol, and me around like marionettes as she shot several rolls of film. When we were done, Dad said, Can I get a few reprints, Susan, and maybe an 8x10 of that shot where Carol pulls down my beard? Of course, Bill, it will take a couple of weeks though. I'll send them to you. Thanks, I'll look forward to getting them. Dad stayed for another hour before leaving for home. During that time we dragged out the leftovers and had some dinner. Dad didn't say another word about the kiss before leaving. After he had left we cleaned up a little and then sat to watch one of the many holiday movies. Aunt Jess didn't have to be back to work until Tuesday so she would be with us until Monday night. The following morning was like Christmas again. Aunt Jessica had brought in the gifts from her car that we hadn't gotten to yesterday because of dinner and Dad's presents. I received several pretty blouses and two denim skirts. I didn't have to wear my corset when I dressed because the new clothes hadn't been tailored to a 19-inch waist. It was heavenly. Naturally I wore my new pendant all day. Sherry and Heather came over in the afternoon and were overwhelmed by the message that Brad had engraved. Sherry said, Wow, cries, this is almost like a proposal of marriage. Like, for sure, Heather echoed. I'm surprised it isn't a ring. Proposal? Don't be silly. We're just friends. You may think so, Sherry said but I'm not sure that that's the way Brad is thinking. Guys don't say things like this on such expensive jewelry unless they are very serious. Like, totally, Heather muttered. The ring will probably be next. But we're just friends. We're not even going steady. Say you, Carol said. Brad hasn't dated anyone else since your first party together. I heard that he didn't even date while we were in California. 
didn't even dance with anyone at the parties while we were gone. Sherry said, the word around the school is that you belong to Brad and it's hands off or else. Like, totally true, cries. In everyone's mind you and Brad are an item. You couldn't get another guy to even bring you to a funeral. He would be afraid that he would the next one needing a casket after Brad found out. I hadn't realized that it had gotten this bad even though I was aware of Brad's attempts to thwart all other possible suitors by monopolizing my time at the parties. I thought that I was successfully using the situation to avoid having to refuse dates from other boys, but now it appeared that I might have seemed to encourage Brad's ardor. But I didn't really believe that he was thinking of marriage. He still had five or more years of college in front of him if he wanted to become a lawyer. No one would be thinking of marriage with that facing him. I felt confident that Sherry and Heather's comments were unfounded. Or so I hoped. Brad called me early in the evening and we spoke for about an hour, until it was Carol's time to use the phone. As we said our goodbyes before hanging up, Brad said, love ya just before the line went dead. I hung up the phone and thought again about Sherry and Heather's statements. No, I thought, it was just a standard phrase used when saying good. Bye. The next day I put on some of my new Elusa clothes, a pair of flats, and my new wig, in preparation for going to the mall. Sherry, Heather, Carol, and I left around 11 o'clock. We ran into some friends at the mall, who were surprised to see me wearing a wig, but they didn't let my secret out and I was able to shop in peace. I did notice a few people looking at me very closely. They were probably trying to figure out where they knew me from, but they never made the connection while I was in disguise. We took the ID bracelet to the jewelry store where I had purchased it, so that I could have it engraved. As we entered, Carol said, what are you going to engrave on it? Brad wants Brad on it. But what else are you going to have engraved? Like on the back? Sherry said, think about it carefully. It'll be there forever. Don't lead him on too much if you aren't serious, Heather added. How about if I just say, love Crystal? Nope, not enough after what he wrote, Carol said. You have to say something more personal, Sherry said. Love, Crystal uh, sounds pretty personal to me. What do you want me to say, to my master, from your love slave, Crystal? Heather looked thoughtful. That's a bit too much at this point. Save that for after you get engaged. I rolled my eyes. Heather, I was being facetious. What's that? It means humorously sarcastic. Oh. Well, like, I wouldn't do it anyway. At least not yet. Carol said, how about something like to a wonderful guy, love crystal, dot. Nope, not personal enough after what he wrote, Sherry said. What about, to the quarterback of my heart, love crystal? Heather said. I don't know, sounds a little corny, doesn't it? Carol said. How about, to Brad, a great guy and my friend, love, Crystal? I said. Perfect, Carol said, personal without being too personal. Yeah, I like it, Sherry said. Me too, Heather agreed, after he proposes, you can get more personal. Heather, he is not going to propose, I said. Maybe, maybe not. I decided to drop it because I knew that I would never change Heather's mind once she had finally made it up, unless I waited ten minutes until she forgot that she had made a decision. The sales clerk who had been listening patiently while we decided on the engraving slogan said, That's it then, to Brad, a great guy and my friend, love, Crystal? I nodded. Here's your receipt. It will be ready tomorrow afternoon. Thank you. We left the store and wandered through the mall, stopping into a store here and there. 
at around 3 o'clock, we stopped for a slice of pizza. The mall was alive with high school kids by now and it wasn't long before a crowd of friends started to surround us. Many of them didn't recognize me at first since I was out of a uniform. My pendant quickly became the main topic of conversation and every girl there wanted to touch it and read the engraved inscription. At this rate, everyone in school would know about it long before Christmas vacation was over. After an hour in the pizza restaurant we paid our bill and continued our tour of the stores. As dinner time approached, we left for home. Mom and Aunt Jess had dinner almost ready so we dropped our things in our rooms and went down for supper. I took a few minutes to take the wig off and comb out my hair before going down. We said good bye to Aunt Jessica after dinner. She had to be at work the next day so her Christmas three-day weekend was over. Carol, Mom, and I would be off for the next two weeks for Christmas vacation. It wouldn't all be fun though because as soon as we went back to school we would be having midterm exams, so we would have to spend part of our vacation time preparing. Carol headed for the phone as soon as Aunt Jess had gone. Brad managed to get through on the phone, right after Carol's hour was up, to invite me to a New Year's Eve party at his parents' house. Debbie was going to a party with her parents so my only other option was to stay home. I don't know, Brad. My mom may not let me go to a party where liquor is being served. That's not a problem. My folks will be there and they won't let me drink. It's not a big party, just half a dozen couples. Please come. I don't want to be alone on New Year's Eve. You won't be alone. You said that there would be a half dozen couples there. Aww. You know what I mean. I giggled. Yes, I know what you mean. You want someone to kiss at midnight, other than your mother. Brad laughed. I certainly can't kiss her like I kiss you. I would hope not. I still have to ask mom. Hold on. I put the receiver down on the floor where I was sitting and got up. Mom was watching television in the living room. Mom, Brad's on the phone. He wants me to come to a party on New Year's Eve at his house. Alone. Without your sister? He didn't extend the invitation to include her. Mom looked thoughtful for a minute. All your dates have been chaperoned by your sister up until now, but I guess that you're old enough to go alone, but only until 1 a.m. And no drinking, young lady. Okay, Mom. Thanks. Picking up the receiver I said, Brad, my mom says okay, but only until 1 a.m. No problem. I'll pick you up at 7.30. There will be plenty of food so don't eat too much for dinner. I didn't say anything, but I knew that I wouldn't be able to eat much because I would have to wear the corset if I wanted to fit into any of my best clothes. What should I wear? Is the party formal? Semi-formal. No jeans or anything like that, but you don't need a prom dress. You can wear your regular school clothes because you always look so great in school. Okay. I'll be ready at 7.30 Friday. We continued to talk for the rest of my hour. Brad had heard about my being in the mall with my wig and disguise. He said, that's great. Now we can go out in the afternoons without fear of being stampeded by your fans. How about tomorrow afternoon? Can't. I already made arrangements to go shopping with Carol. Friday is only four days away. How about Wednesday then? He wasn't going to give up so I gave in. Okay. Wednesday. Great. What time? Ten. I laughed. No. How about eleven? Okay. I'll pick you up at eleven.
Okay. I'll see you then. Good night. Good night, my beautiful crystal. I continued to sit on the floor after I hung up the phone. I was concerned that Brad seemed to be getting a little too serious. It was one thing to go out with him to maintain my imposture, and quite another thing, indeed, to become the love focus of his life. I had really come to like Brad and I didn't want to see him hurt. After a rocky beginning on our first date, he had proven himself to be a gentleman. I enjoyed his company and had fun on our dates. He was even a good kisser and I didn't mind being held in his strong arms as he gave me French lessons. Lately I had begun to wonder if I was enjoying the kissing just a little too much. My medicine kept me from becoming aroused sexually, but I had begun to enjoy kissing Brad almost as much as I enjoyed kissing Debbie, and that confused me. I wondered if I would have become aroused if I wasn't on the medication. For all intents and purposes I was a teenage girl. I had real breasts and a simulated vagina. For six months I had lived every minute of my life as a woman. And when I was with my friends we spent a great deal of time discussing boys. Wasn't it only natural to develop an attraction to boys? Or was I just talking myself into it because I was living as a woman and relationships between men and women are a naturally occurring event? I was still attracted to Debbie, but if we tried to carry on a relationship we would be marked as lesbians and that might have an adverse effect on my theatrical hopes. Nor would it be fair to Debbie. For the time being, I should continue to date Brad. He would be going off to college in seven months and most high school romances end when that happens, if not before. So for the near future, I decided to enjoy my time with him. Everyone in school identified me as his girl anyway, so I might as well relax and enjoy myself. I didn't want to sit home every night while my girlfriends were out having fun. So from now on, I am determined to act like all of the other girls acted towards their boyfriends. I would be indifferent at times, and jealous at others, dominant when I had to be, and submissive when the situation called for it, in short, a normal high school girl. Sex was out of the question, of course, but everything else was okay. I picked up Brad's ID bracelet from the jewelry store the next day. They had wrapped it again so it would be like another present. I put it into my purse and we continued shopping. I found a wonderful pair of earrings that matched my pendant quite well even though they didn't have any diamonds in them. I also picked up some stockings, underwear, and a couple of slips. Carol found a new purse that she liked and Sherry and Heather went crazy as usual, each buying several skirts, blouses, and pairs of shoes. It was dinner time by the time that we left the mall. Brad picked me up on Wednesday. He commented on my not wearing my usual attire and I explained that when I was in disguise I had to look like everyone else. He seemed a little disappointed but didn't say anything else about it. He just nodded. I was probably able to climb up into the 4x4 by myself, but Brad didn't wait to see. He just picked me up as usual and put me in the seat, taking time to fasten my seatbelt before hurrying around to the driver's side. As he slid into the driver's seat I said, where are we going? I thought that we might start at the arcade, and then take in a matinee at the Cineplex. Brad drove to the new arcade that had opened last summer. It was packed with kids on this vacation day, and we spent about two hours playing games before leaving for the movie theater. Brad was very competitive and I didn't even half try, preferring to let him win by wide margins in every game that we played. He spent a lot of time showing me how to do it better but I pretended that I just couldn't learn it. He also played a couple of games by himself while I stood by and watched. We met a lot of kids that we knew from school and were never alone while we were in the arcade. I had a chance to talk with the girls, while Brad's buddies cheered him on. 
Many of the girls knew about the pendant and everyone wanted to see it and read the inscription. A couple of them told me how lucky I was to have such a great boyfriend. I seem to have stopped being Crystal Ramsey for a while and become simply Brad's girlfriend. We made it to the theater in time for the 2.30 movie, picked up sodas and popcorn on the way in, and found our seats in the illuminated theater just minutes before the house lights dimmed and the movie began. Brad put his arm around my shoulders and it stayed there for the entire show. I held the popcorn and sodas on my lap and served as an armrest and table to Brad. Once the popcorn was gone, he pulled me closer and I rested my head on his shoulder for the rest of the show. We stopped for pizza after we left the movie house. Again, we were surrounded by kids from school. I wound up sitting on one side of the table with the girls, while Brad held court on the other side with the guys. We stayed there until almost five and then Brad took me home. On Thursday, I spent most of the day working in the house. I studied for my midterms and also worked on the play for several hours. I had most of the lines down pat by now and I was working on my movements and delivery. Rehearsals would start in earnest again when school resumed and I was determined to be ready. I had made arrangements with Miss Boyer to visit her house next week to work on the song that I would have to sing solo. Friday was occupied with getting ready for my date with Brad. Carol was going to a party with Vinnie DeMarco because she and Adam had still not reconciled. We spent the day doing each other's nails and hair. I hadn't worn the corset since Christmas Day and I felt uncomfortable as Carol laced me down. That passed quickly however as I adapted to it. Mom nixed the dress that I was going to wear and picked something different because she felt that my selection was a little too loud for a party with Brad's parents. You want to make a good impression on your future in-laws, she said. I rolled my eyes and sighed because I knew that she was rubbing me. She just giggled. The skirt that she had picked was a simple, black, almost knee-length, cotton and rayon skirt that Barbara had altered to hug my shape. It was so tight that I could barely walk in it. It was a good thing that I wouldn't be walking very much. Mom also selected a tight, white, back-buttoned, low-cut blouse with ruffles at the neck and wrists. The low cut would allow easy viewing of my pendant and my cleavage. For shoes, Mom selected a pair of plain black, single strap, for inch heels. I put on my new pendant earrings, spayed a little perfume, and I was ready when Brad arrived. I had to hold on to the railing as I struggled to descend the stairs in the ultra-tight skirt. Brad saw me as I came down and complimented me. It was obvious that he liked seeing me dressed more like this than the way that I had been dressed the other day in loose-fitting clothes. Brad held my coat for me and we said good. Bye. To mom. Vinny hadn't arrived yet so Carol was still getting ready upstairs. Brad had to lift me into the 4 by 4 this time. He buckled on the seatbelt and then stopped to kiss me. I kissed him for a couple of seconds and then pushed away. Brad, it's too cold. Closed the door and turned the heater on. He smiled at me, closed my door and hurried around to the driver's side. He hadn't even finished closing his door before starting the car. The engine was still very warm so we had heat right away. Brad's house was enormous. In fact, it couldn't even be called a house. It was more like a mansion. It sat on a small hill surrounded by several acres of land. I would be willing to bet that during the summer the lawns were impeccably manicured. The house was well lit and there were a few strings of Christmas lights decorating several of the bushes near the main entrance. Brad drove past the front door and parked beneath a carport on the side of the building. He got out, came around to my side, lifted me up and carried me to the door. Instead of putting me down, 
He opened the door and carried me inside to an entrance hallway, where Brad almost walked into a woman wearing a beautiful, floor-length, blue silk evening gown. Brad said, Oh, hi mom. This is Crystal. Hello Crystal, are you injured? Brad suddenly realized that he was still carrying me and let me down. No, Mrs. Reese. Brad just didn't want me to get my feet wet in the snow. It's a pleasure to meet you. How do you do? Well, that's a relief. I'm very well, and it's a pleasure to meet you as well. Welcome to our house. Thank you. Brad, why don't you show Crystal into the living room? Our other guests will be arriving shortly and I still have a few details to attend to. To me she said, we'll have a chance to talk later, my dear. Forgive me but I'm quite busy right now. Of course, Mrs. Reese. Please let me know if I can do anything to help. Brad led me down the hallway and into an enormous room that I assumed to be the living room. He helped me off with my coat and then took it somewhere, along with his own. He returned a few minutes later. There was a great fire going in the fireplace and I was warm again in minutes. Brad pointed out the family pictures on the mantel and told me who everyone was. He had an older brother and an older sister. Brad was the a baby of the family. His older brother was an attorney in Washington and his sister was a dental surgeon in Chicago. They had been here for Christmas, but had returned to their homes since. I also got a run down on the rest of the family. Brad's father came in as Brad was finishing the genealogy run down. Dad, I'd like to introduce you to Miss Crystal Ramsey. Crystal, this is my dad. How do you do, Miss Ramsey? Welcome to our home. You're even lovelier than you look on television. I smiled at his compliment and replied with, Thank you, Mr. Reese. It's a pleasure to be here and to meet you. I can see where Brad gets his good looks. Mr. Reese smiled. Oh, I like her, Brad. I can see why you're so smitten. Crystal, has your television series ended? Yes, sir. The show was canceled. That's too bad. I enjoyed it. Did you see any of the episodes before I joined the cast? Well, no. They were written by a different group of writers. The decision to cancel the series had already been made by the network before I was brought on board as a regular. The producer was hoping that they would change their mind and made wholesale changes at the time that I was hired. I guess that it was too late though. Do you have anything else in the works? No, not yet, nothing professionally anyway. I have a part in the school play. Oh. What play are you doing? Irma La Daus. Great story. What role do you have? I'm Irma. Well, that makes sense. Wise decision to use the best actress in the lead. Thank you. The front door bell rang just then and Mr. Reese excused himself to go greet the guests. Brad took me to the bar in the next room so that we could get a soda. A bartender was setting out snacks and organizing the bar. He filled two large glasses with ice and cola, and we grabbed a couple of tiny egg rolls before returning to the living room. Four people had come in and Brad's father introduced us. Over the next half hour four more couples arrived. The party seemed to be more of a political caucus than a New Year's Eve party because of the jobs of the guests. The final count was one councilman, three judges, our state representative to the House in Washington, and our state's lieutenant governor, plus their wives. I knew that Brad's father was a lawyer but I didn't know that he was so politically involved. Most of the guests clustered around me for the first hour. 
I found myself repeating my arise to fame story in complete detail, only leaving out the detail of how I became crystal. These well-known people, who traveled in the circles of the rich and powerful, all seemed to be infatuated with the brief career of one young actress. Eventually they broke off into small groups to discuss politics. At midnight we counted down the seconds until midnight and then hooped and blew noisemakers for a couple of minutes. Brad wrapped his arms around me and kissed me deeply. When we broke up I realized that all of the men were walking around kissing each of the women and I was somehow included in that. Only the local councilman tried to slip me tongue, although one of the judges came back for seconds. When the shouting was all done and everyone had settled down, Brad and I sat down on one of the couches. I suddenly remembered the ID bracelet and I got the package out of my purse. Brad looked at me questioningly when I handed it to him. I said, it's your Christmas present. The jewelers wrapped it again after engraving it. Oh. Great. Let me look at it. Brad tore the wrapping off of the jewelry case and opened the box. He unhooked the bracelet from the clips that were used to keep it laid out straight in the case and examined it. After looking at the a Brad on the front, he turned it over and read the inscription. I saw his face light up and he bent to kiss me. He took his time with the kiss and I thought that it would never end. When he finally broke it off, he said, Thank you. I love you too. Then he read the inscription out loud. To Brad, a great guy and my love, Crystal. I realized immediately that the jewelry engraver had made a mistake and left out the word a friend. What had been intended as a personal message of friendship had become a pronouncement of love. I agonized for a minute and then decided that I couldn't tell Brad of the mistake. It would really burst his bubble and I didn't want to hurt him like that. So it would have to stay as it was, and he would have to think that I was telling him that I loved him. And after all, what did it hurt? Brad put the ID bracelet on his right wrist and then bent over to kiss me again. I pushed him away and said, Brad, not here. The last kiss had everyone looking at us as it is. He looked around the room and then said sheepishly, sorry. I was so excited that I completely forgot about everybody else. Let's get another soda. Brad pulled me up and we went into the area where the bar was set up. He steered me right past the bar and through a doorway and into a hallway. Once the door was closed he bent over me and kissed me like it was the last that he would ever see me. We must have kissed for five minutes before he let me come up for air. When we stopped he said, let's make it official. Make what official? Us. Here, he said as he took off his class ring and held it out to me. What's that for? I'm making it official that you're mine. I want you to wear my ring. I thought about it for a second. I couldn't very well refuse after what the engraver had put on the back of the ID bracelet, because I hadn't told him that it was a mistake. I don't know Brad. I don't want to have any problems. What kind of problems, he asked cautiously. I'm about to be in a play where I have to kiss another actor, repeatedly. I may also have to kiss a lot of other actors if I get more work. I don't want any problems from a jealous boyfriend looking for an exclusive, and I don't want you to cause pain by having your friends rib you about it. It was lame, but it was all that I could think of on the spur of the moment. That's no problem, dear. I understand that it's just a job. I promise that I won't get outwardly jealous even if I feel it inside and wish that it was me kissing you. The ring just means that we are exclusive to one another, in social conditions. There's also the problem of my schedule. We may not be together a lot because of my involvement with acting. I will have to go away from my job, and I can't always go out because of my fame. 
That doesn't matter. It will make the time that we are together all the more precious. I felt trapped and couldn't think of any way to avoid hurting Brad, so I took the ring. This set him off again, and we spent another five minutes kissing. When he was done, I said, "We have to get going. It's almost one o'clock." Okay. Let's go say goodbye to everyone, and then I'll take you home. We went back into the living room and said our goodbyes. Everyone told me that they were happy to have met me, and I echoed their sentiments. Five minutes later, I was standing inside the hallway near the carport as Brad heated up the engine and car. When he came back in, Brad swept me up into his arms and carried me to the car. I was getting used to this by now. He placed me in the front passenger seat and buckled the seat belt around me. Fifteen minutes later, we pulled up in front of my house. It was still ten minutes before one o'clock, so we sat in the warm car and kissed. Exactly at one, a car pulled up behind us. Brad got out to see who it was, and then came around to my side and opened the door. It's just Vinny and Carol, he said as he unbuckled the seatbelt and carried me to the front door. We kissed one last time, quickly because it was cold, and then I went inside. I had just reached the top of the stairs to the bedrooms when I heard Carol come in and lock the door. I dropped my things on my bed and sat down. Carol came up and went into her room. A few minutes later, she came into my room through the bathroom connection. She was bubbling over with happiness, and she said. Happy New Year, sis. Well, how did it go? Who was at your party? Looking a little closer at me, she added, "And why do you look so sad? You won't believe what happened." I don't believe what happened. What happened? Carol said, a note of concern in her voice. Remember the ID bracelet? Yeah. What about it? The jeweler made a mistake on the engraving. Instead of writing to Brad, a great guy and my friend, love Crystal, they wrote it to Brad, a great guy and my love, Crystal. Dot. Carol mouthed the words after I finished and then smiled. So what's so bad about that? Just take it back and have it redone. It was their mistake, so they have to make good on it. But I didn't see it until after I gave it to Brad. He was so happy that he could hardly contain himself. I couldn't just tell him that it was all a mistake. Oh, that's different. That's not all. What else? Brad gave me his class ring. He wanted to make us official. A dot. I held up Brad's ring that I had been squeezing in my hand. And you took it. What else could I do? I didn't correct the mistake with the ID bracelet right away, and then I felt I couldn't back out of it without hurting him. Carol sat down next to me and hugged me. Oh, I thought that it was something serious. So he gave you his ring. So what? You were going out with him exclusively anyway. Nothing's really changed. But this makes it official in his words. It's like he owns me now or something. I don't know what he's going to expect. Don't worry about it. If things get out of control, you just give him back his ring. In the meantime, enjoy being the squeeze of the hunkiest guy in school. Do you think that he'll expect me to have sex with him now? What he expects and what he gets are two different things. Just tell him that you are saving it for marriage, and that's that. I hope it's that easy. Today is the first day of the last year in the twentieth century. We, as women, have all the power. We say when and where. If we don't want it, it doesn't happen. Just remember that. Now tell me who was at the party. After I named all of the guests, Carol said, 
Just old people? No other kids. Bummer. Who was at your party? Well, aside from Vinny's parents and several other old couples, there was Cindy and Mike, Sharon and Ben, and Maria and Tony. Plus Vinny and me. But you didn't get to kiss the lieutenant governor. I'll live. I laughed at what she said and the expression that she made while saying it. Carol said, maybe Heather was right. About what? Well, on Sunday she said that the next step would be a ring. Of course she meant an engagement ring. Brad is not going to propose. We're only in high school. Probably not. But if he does, please don't just take the ring simply because you don't want to hurt his feelings. Okay. I smiled and said, okay, sis. I promise. Good. Let me help you out of that Iron Maiden and then I'm ready for bed. Carol had buoyed my spirits considerably. She helped me to get undressed and then went to her bedroom after we kissed goodnight. As I lay in bed, I thought about what she had said. I guess that she was right. Taking Brad's ring didn't give him any special privileges that he didn't have before. I was just his steady girlfriend, nothing more. Knowing that I wasn't going to marry Brad didn't keep my subconscious mind from thinking about it as I slept, though. In my dream we were married and had two children, both girls. I had given up my career as an actress and had also forsaken college to stay home and care for the children. Brad was a young lawyer struggling to establish himself and working late hours. We had moved in with his parents because we didn't have much money, but through it all we were happy. As a result of a tragic airplane accident that took his parents, Brad became the head of the household. Like his father before him, Brad was heavily into politics and we entertained often, with powerful political persons always in attendance. Brad, at 26, had run for statewide office and won. After that he continued to move upwards, first as lieutenant governor and then as governor. We spent eight years in the governor's mansion before moving to Washington when Brad was elected as a state senator. Twelve years later he became vice president and after two terms, ran for president. Just as the election results were being announced, which declared that Brad had been elected, I woke up. Please subscribe for the next part and visit my Patreon page for early access. Link in the comment, thanks.